Hello and uh, welcome to this week's edition of uh, Politics Today and in this programme today we will be discussing are we in a new Cold War and so to join me in this programme I'm joined by Tim Dieppe uh, from Christian Concern together with uh, Michael McCann who's the director of Israel Britain Alliance and of course uh, a former Labour Member of Parliament so gentlemen welcome to the programme good Thank see you, you back on Michael and um, Tim I'll, I'll start off with, with you really um, Jeremy Hunt wrote a very interesting um, article in the uh, Daily Telegraph he said that we've forgotten that peace comes from strength mm. and that we've entered essentially into a new Cold War that we've forgotten the lessons of the Cold War and that is deterrent. If we want peace, we've got to show strength and because the West showed a lack of strength and a of resolve against Russian aggression, mm. we're paying the price. Um, what are your thoughts? Well, I think he's absolutely right, isn't he? And, and it's good that people are coming out and saying this. I think, you know, it is a new Cold War or perhaps a renewed Cold War. I mean, I think Putin never thought the Cold War really ended. I think he's had a Cold War mindset ever since. He was a member of the KGB and this has always been his intention, I think, to regain um, these states and particularly Ukraine has been in his sights for a long time. Um, and I think the West has been lulled into a false sense of security, um, particularly the Germans and some other countries very, very dependent on uh, Russian oil and gas um, and, and lowering defence spending in incredibly as well. And I think, you know, it's all coming up to roost and we're all waking up to, gosh, this is the real world now and, and um, we need to take precautions and desperately looking to increase defence spending and work out how we can get off dependence on Russian oil. And so, yes, this is where we are. It's a new Cold War, a renewed Cold War, and, um, and we're in a new regime and, and um, it's putting a lot of other things in perspective, I think. Uh, and Michael, what are your thoughts on this um, hideous uh, invasion? of the Ukraine by, by Russia and how Boris Johnson's government's responded to this crisis? Well, my view is that uh, why did these politicians that have got intelligence services that we spend an awful lot of money on uh, not see it coming? Because it's not, it's not new. I mean, he invaded Crimea in 2014 mm. uh, and Angela Merkel was, was up to her, her legacy when it's written in history will be that she was the, the chancellor in Germany that that created this problem because she is now the biggest economy in, in, in Europe is in hock to Russian oil and gas and it's going to be very difficult to wean uh, not only Germany but the, the, the whole continent off uh, those particular uh, fossil fuels. But my main problem with the whole issue about politicians saying that it's time for the uh, increase in defence spending is, is that where have they been? Where have they been for the last number of years? Because this threat was out in the open. It was quite clear that, uh, that Putin's uh, views were expansionist because just in the same way uh, as Hitler wrote Mein Kampf, he wrote a 6,800 word essay about uh, Russian expansionism. And so therefore, um, I think we should be asking the questions about why our politicians weren't on the ball on this and why they haven't done more to, to see the potential for all this taking place and ensuring that there was more support uh, for Ukraine in place. To be fair to the UK government, uh, we did and we have uh, trained the Ukrainian army, but the USA, for example, were frightened about training them because what Russia might have done. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just, it's crazy, it's nonsense, and we're going to end up in a situation where one wrong step literally one wrong step and we're in World War Three. Uh, and, and Tim, um, historically ever since we saw the foundation of uh, NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, I think it was either established in yep. uh, 1946 or 1947, uh, around there was, was set up as a, a defense mechanism for Europe to stop Soviet expansionism into into uh, Western Europe, but also to, and then the, the Soviets set up the Warsaw Pact and, and we had this Cold War yeah. standoff between the mm. two, uh, known as uh, mutually assured destruction, that if, if the Soviets fired nuclear weapons, yeah. we would fire uh, nuclear weapons and there'd be a mm. guaranteed mutually assured destruction called MAD. Yeah. Um, but do you, do you think that our, our politicians over the last and our leaders over the last couple of decades certainly have become complacent when it comes to Putin. Uh, a mindset that geostrategic politics doesn't matter anymore because the world has moved on. We've also had uh, military generals and others saying that uh, we will never see a kind of conventional military war again, but we have for the first time in 80 years with Russia's invasion of the Ukraine. 
Oh, I mean, definitely there's been a, a measure of complacency here and a, a measure of sort of blindness to it and a measure of really not wanting to believe it as well. I think there's a lot of wishful thinking. Like, we want to believe we're living in a peaceful world forevermore. We want to believe we're not going to see war in Europe again. And, 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 and that's what we'd like to see. And therefore, let's save money on guns and, and spend it on hospitals. I mean, everyone wants to believe that, don't they? But we're living in the real world. And actually, the real world isn't necessarily like that. And, and Putin's spotted weakness. Um, now in the West in various ways and for various reasons and I think there's sort of moral failures as well you know, the, the betrayal of Afghanistan is clearly a factor in his mind looking at the weakness there not wanting to risk any more lives and very happy to just turn it over to the Taliban what you know the, the mild reaction to China taking Hong Kong as well these are all factors that that, that um, Putin will be looking at and China will be thinking about Taiwan as well um, so yes you know we're, we're living in the real world and we've suddenly had to wake up to what the real world really is like and um, and you, we've kind of been disillusioned about that I think in the last few years and um, and waking up to reality here yeah and um, Michael are we also seeing the emergence now I think this has been on the cards for for a number of years but it's really coming to the fore now uh, a kind of new access of evil in the world with the uh, the Russians the Chinese and the Iranians possibly even the Turks now uh, forming alliance against the West I, I think it's always been there because, you know, the, the, if you recall, there was a time when uh, Putin was apparently considering joining NATO. Uh, that never happened, and I, think, I thought it was always going to be unlikely. Uh, I think the alliance has developed uh, over the years, and people maybe started thinking, well, what's this for? As, as Tim says, we, we don't need it, we can spend more money in hospitals. It's interesting, of course, that the people who would be on the streets, you know, the Socialist Workers' Party and all those, stop the war, those very same people are now tweeting in support of, surprise, surprise, Putin. So we know what side these people are on when it comes to uh, whether they believe in the UK democracy, freedom, uh, and uh, what's happening in the Ukraine. When people start saying things like the attack in the Maripol maternity hospital was fake news and saying all this type of stuff. This is, and, and we've got academics, professors in their universities who are saying these things and getting away with it. I hope it finally gets these cuckoos out of the nest and we can see them for what they <laughs> actually are. But yeah, whether the, I think these countries, look, China is not a democracy. Russia is not a democracy. Iran is not a democracy. They all share that theme. They don't, you know, in, in our country, uh, when we elect uh, a new parliament, the MPs who have lost, and I know this from the harsh reality, you've got six days to clear your office and you're out. And that's refreshing because that's what democracy should be about. Uh, but... Let's not kid ourselves on, these countries are not democracies. Uh, Putin is a dictator. And since he came back, remember, this is his second term as president. He's come back, and he's come back as a less rational individual, it appears to me. There was some uh, suspicion. I, I heard um, Lord Owen, the former foreign secretary, saying that the puffiness, etc., that in the, of his face, they don't know if he's perhaps on steroids or something like that, and maybe uh, there's some link there to his health. But bottom line is, these are not democracies. They are dictators, and we should treat them accordingly. And you know, in this world of, in this time of global trade, which has been uh, always been put at the forefront rather than perhaps defending ourselves, we should recognise that in peacetime, you know, trading with people is a good thing because trading with, with partners and working with other people is a good thing, but we should never drop our guard. And if that's the one tiny little silver lining around this massive black cloud, then we should, we should take it that people will now realise that defence is still extremely important and we must pay for it. No, absolutely. Uh, and Tim, if we look at the kind of doctrine of, of within the um, Cold War, the so doctrine of deterrence, yeah. um, that if uh, the Soviets moved their forces closer to, to Western Europe, then kind of NATO would respond with a massive deployment of, of NATO forces as well. Yeah. But then also we saw that if, uh, if the West said something, it was backed up by strength uh, mm. with military threats. Mm. Uh, and we see that the way that uh, Biden and uh, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, have actually handled this crisis, mm. effectively say there is no way we are going to intervene in this crisis, mm. um, only mm. if a, a fellow NATO member is attacked. Now, as a recording in this programme, we've seen that, uh, that uh, Russian forces are being very close to targeting Poland, um, and, and getting ever closer to NATO members. So yeah. um, do you think this needs a kind of radical strategic rethink in Washington and in London about how to respond to, to, uh, to Russian aggression uh, and how the, if, if the West doesn't back up with force what it says, then yeah. of course we're just a paper tiger, aren't we? 
Well, yeah, absolutely you need a deterrent. I mean, deterrent is actually what stops war at the end of the day. People decide it's not worth it, you know, because they're scared. You know, so actually deterrent is what provides peace at the end of the day. So you do need deterrent. Um, whether they should be, you know, actually imposing a no-fly zone, I have hesitations about that because that could easily lead to World War III. I mean, what you've got then is, you know, presumably, you know, airports that are housing the aircrafts that are flying up, they become targets as well. And, and suddenly you're into a full-on attack at NATO and, and, you know, who knows how that could escalate. So I sympathise with that to a degree. And, and let's be honest, we are supplying a lot of high-tech weapons into Ukraine. Russia has definitely been surprised by the strength of opposition, uh, by the, the way that their military has reacted, the, and the strength of the Ukrainian resistance, and the, the weapons that they're being used to take out these tanks and planes, and so on. So we are doing a lot of help, actually, um, behind the scenes, and that is providing something of a deterrent, and we will see how it plays out in terms of, you know, what happens to the Russian military going forward. I think they'll live to regret it. Um, but yes, you know, the West needs to definitely be prepared to be a strong deterrent because that will, that's actually what provides peace. Absolutely. And uh, Michael, um, I mean, it's pretty much unheard of that so we have uh, in Ukraine uh, President uh, Zelensky actually addressing a full house in Parliament over Zoom. Uh, he's done this with the uh, Senate and the Congress as well. Um, what do you make of uh, President Zelensky's uh, kind of leadership skills um, during the midst of this crisis? I don't think you can be anything else other than immensely impressed by him. I mean, his credentials as a politician are a bit unusual. He comes from a uh, from a from a entertainment background. He was a comedian, but I've got to be honest with you, he's not been a comedian when he's been addressing either his nation or other nations. I think his his fellow countrymen and women should be extremely proud of him, uh, and I think we should also be proud of him. On the point, Tim was 100% right with his analysis there. But can I just say that's one thing. For those that are talking about no-fly zoning and, and, and putting that in place, particularly I laugh when I hear Nicola Sturgeon talking about it. I mean, it's, she's so desperate to get it front of the media, she'll literally say anything. <laughs> uh, but this is a woman that wanted, from a party that doesn't want to be part of NATO. <laughs> yeah. It's extraordinary. But before we jump in and say we should be doing more and everything like that, first of all, it's what is our justification? And we, you know, UK, unfortunately, is not part of NATO. Perhaps if it had been... Uh, then the deterrent would have been in place, the very point that, that Tim makes. But I would also say this, if we're trying to claim there's some sort of moral standards that we should be adopting that, say that, we should, that, that says that we should be stepping in with more help on the ground now, then why didn't we do it in Syria? Because mm -hmm. the same um, you know, barbarism was taking place there. In fact, in many cases, it's, and Ukraine might get to this, but see, it was even worse in Syria in terms of flattening uh, Aleppo and other places. So before we start getting our moral compasses out and claiming um, the moral uh, high ground, let's just remember where when we've sat back and we've not done anything at all for people and we've watched them in our television screens, screens uh, dying uh, under the barbarism of others. Uh, and, and Tim, do you think uh, the West is slowly waking up to the reality of the lessons that we learnt in the 1930s and the 1940s that a policy of appeasement doesn't pay? And that, uh, you know, I think Jeremy Hunt, uh, the former um, uh, foreign secretary, is also calling on European NATOs to increase their defence spending by 4% of GDP to counter these uh, new global threats we're facing, whether it's from Russia yep. or China or yep. a nuclear Iran. It's amazing how quickly things can shift, isn't it, from, from a war. A war suddenly shifts everybody, has shifts everyone's perspective and, and changes the way people think about things. And so we've seen massive shifts in, in uh, thinking about defence spending. Suddenly, you know, Germany suddenly increased straight up to 2%, which they should have done before um, under NATO, having resisted it for years and years and years. And then suddenly war breaks out, right, we're, 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 you know, reverse the policy straight away like that. So, you know, let's see, but, you know, there's still... You know, the start, I think I sense there's still a hesitancy there and a still a redu reluctance there, um, even within government, to sort of keep spending, uh, want to up the spending on military. So, you know, we'll see what really happens here. But um, I think, you know, we've just been talking about deterrent and that's what we need to be prepared to have a proper deterrent. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, and, and do you think that what we're seeing here with the, the weakness on behalf of President Biden and uh, Antony Blinken and the way they responded to this crisis is also weakening uh, NATO as a force? Because there's lots of speculation, particularly spearheaded by the French President uh, Macron, uh, calling for Europe to have its own army independent of NATO within Europe. Well, I've got to be honest with you, you know, it could be worse. We could have a Donald Trump there and he'd be arguing not to be a member of NATO. 
I mean, you know, for many th many of the st things that I deal with in my daily life now in terms of Israel, Donald Trump was good for us. But in this, he was all over the place. And I just don't get what his friendship was or the connection with Putin and how that all developed. But let's be honest, we've got Biden because America was desperate to get rid of Trump. And the Democratic Party picked Biden, who, and I've got to be honest with you, I mean, I, I, I'm 58 years of age uh, and, um, you know, doing that job would be tough. You know, it's every hour of every day, it's waking up in the middle of the night, it's, and he's a commander in chief, and he's just not up to it. He's a, and, I, and this is no disrespect to older people. My mother's 84 years of age and still as sharp as a tack, but the bottom line is, he's not up to running the United States of America. And even worse, Kamala Harris. My goodness, I saw her being interviewed, uh, doing a press conference with uh, the Polish Prime Minister. I was embarrassed. When asked about how many refugees America would take, she laughed nervously. It was the most embarrassing moment I've watched in television, that this is the vice president. The one worry that we have is not that Joe Biden stays in place, is that Joe Biden suddenly mm. passes away mm. and Kamala Harris becomes the, the, the president of the United States of America. That's why the Democrats are frantically searching around for who the next VP candidate will be, because it's not going to be her. So we've, we are where we are. The price of having democracies is that People elect their leaders. The Americans have elected uh, Biden and they knew that Kamala Harris was on the ticket as well. And that's what we've got. And NATO has suffered because, as I say, the UK was brave enough to send people in to train the Ukrainian army. And that's providing dividends now because they're putting up one hell of a fight against the Russians. Uh, but um, definitely NATO has been diminished by the, the weak leadership of the United States of America. And um, Tim, I mean, this also, I mean, a lot of uh, military analysts are kind of very concerned about the prospect of uh, a European army. And we know that British defence officials, when uh, we were part of the EU, very much objected um, to this being on the table. But now it seems out of uh, the debacle we saw in Afghanistan last summer, now the Russian invasion of, of the Ukraine uh, means that uh, if Europe increases its defence spending, then we could see the creation of a, of a European army that is independent of NATO. So, again, how the West responds to this crisis also depends on, on uh, NATO as, uh, as the defence bulwark against any aggression in, uh, in the West. Well, I think if NATO gets replaced, that's, that's a big deal. I, I, at the moment, I can only see that strengthening the resolve of Putin and China and uh, our other enemies. I, you know, I don't think, I think you know, a replacement for NATO, what can really replace it? You know, and, and having the might of America behind it is what really is the deterrent, I think, in it. So I think that would be a mistake to go down that kind of route and try and create an independent army like that. Um, and I think you know, they were denying it, I think, when we were looking at Brexit. And it's quite interesting that it's really very much on the table now. Um, and, um, and I don't think that would be the right way forwards on this. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and Michael, do you think the, the government needs a complete rethink on its defence uh, strategy? Because now for, for so many years, we've, we've allowed our own military forces to be declined and the number of um, soldiers has been reduced. Uh, there's a newspaper article here talking about how that we would only have enough tanks for 12 days of fighting because we haven't got enough tanks, we don't have enough warships, we don't have enough planes, uh, and we are considered one of the strongest militaries in Europe. And uh, yet we see there, there's a massive cut in defence spending. It's a shadow of a doubt. I mean, look, we all thought there was going to be a dividend from the, the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, everyone thought that. And let's not uh, kid ourselves on that somehow we'll get wisdom that we didn't have uh, back then. We thought that we could spend less money on defence and we could put it into more domestic issues, uh, whether that be the National Health Service, the environment or what, whatever the, the subject matter is. Uh, but the world is still a dangerous place and, and until such times as we we can live in harmony with each other and I don't envisage that in my lifetime or beyond uh, then we have to ensure that you have the means to defend yourself and uh, I've got a suggestion and it's not a frivolous one um, because all the talk recently about woke uh, stuff and about how you define a woman and the whole this, these whole debates about um, uh, male, female and it, theirs and all the rest of it. Let's take all the money that's going to be invested in diversity individuals across every single part of the public sector and put that into defence. I'm sure that'll take it up to something like from 2.3% up to something like 3% or 3.5%. And it, it, your viewers might think it's a frivolous point. It's not because that is a complete 
waste of taxpayers' money, and that money should be put to good use, and we're better than the defence of our, our nation. Absolutely. Uh, and Tim, I, I just want to ask your response as well, really showing the generosity of the British people that um, mm. uh, 44,000 Brits have offered to give up uh, a room in their house to um, give refuge to mm. these uh, Ukrainians fleeing that uh, awful war that they're facing. Um, what does this show about Britain as a nation still, that they are able to show incredible hospitality? Um, well, it's, fan it's fantastic nation. generosity of spirit, isn't it? That people and people are watching what they're seeing on the screens and thinking, "How can I help? I, I want to help." And and they're giving money, and now they're saying, "I want to give space in my house for these people who've who've got nowhere to live." And and you know, who who can't sympathise uh, with people who've been bombed out of their houses or having to flee from warfare? You know, what would we do if we were in warfare? We'd want to flee as well. Um, so so yes, a massive generosity of spirit on behalf of the people of Britain. Um, very encouraging to see. Um, of course, there are concerns about um, you know, security and, and how many people are coming through and how much they're being vested and all of that kind of thing. And also, um, how long will this last for? How long will we be housing them for? And how long are people signing up for and all of that? Um, but the generosity spirit can't be faulted. It's fantastic to see it. Um, and I'm encouraged by that and we'll see where it goes from there. Yeah. Uh, Michael, um, Douglas Murray, the uh, social political commentator, makes a kind of interesting point. And he's saying that uh, when we see a crisis like we're seeing today in Ukraine and there's this emotional response to try and help these Ukrainians, he's actually saying what is actually better to do is to give money to the Poles to give money to uh, Mold the Moldovian government uh, and also to the Hungarian government that have actually received um, hundreds of thousands, not million uh, refugees are currently heading towards 2.5 million Ukrainian refugees uh, and just keeping them near Ukraine. So when this war is over and there's a massive uh, rebuilding project going on, they can go back into their homes rather than come to further out towards Britain or to the United States um, and they can go back home. Uh, I respect Douglas Murray completely and once again he, he gets it 100% correct because the countries, in Poland in particular, I mean they didn't have to be forced in any way to take on any refugees, they were there ready, willing and prepared to offer people a uh, safe haven and uh, you know and I think it's possible because how you know Poles were treated after the Second World War when Iron Curtain came down and we abandoned them, uh, despite the fact that their soldiers and fighters uh, were, were stood side by side with British soldiers during the Second World War. Uh, they remember that. They remember the trauma that the, their country went through with the, with the, the German invasion, and therefore uh, they have all that history. I think has uh, enables them to be far more generous of spirit than, than even more than the British. And I think the important thing is that the Ukrainians that are leaving the country, being forced to leave the country because of the war, they want to go back to their own country. They don't want to be in any other nation. And therefore, I think the suggestion that, that Douglas Murray makes is 100% correct. But I don't think it does any harm uh, for, for Britain to offer it. I've got to be honest with you, I'm embarrassed by former colleagues in the Labour Party when I watched the TV in Parliament yesterday about uh, what they're doing. Because they are, uh, the point that Tim makes about security is absolutely crucial. We still have got all the threats of terror that we've always had. They haven't gone away because this war has started. And you don't know what unscrupulous means a, a terrorist will use to get in the, into our country under cover of another humanitarian crisis. And also, uh, whilst admiring those 44,000 people, in fact, I think it's up to 90,000 people now have put wow. themselves forward. You know, and a, and a immediate wave of sympathy that you have for people in those circumstances, you'll make that offer. But you know, you know, it's, uh, there was someone made the point to me. You know that, that you know, so you're making a commitment which is open-ended. And if you've got a family living with you in your house, it's uh, you might think it's okay for a, a week or a fortnight, mm. but can you keep it up for six months, a year, or the three years that these individuals will be given to remain in the UK under the visa, visa conditions imposed or proposed, I should say. So therefore. Um, because I'm reminded of, and this is a true, sto true story, there was an MSP in Scotland called Rosie Kane, who was in the Scottish Socialist Party, you know, the hard left. Mm -hmm. And they were making a big fun uh, song and dance about the Dungable uh, Detention Centre in a place called Straven, which was in part of the constituency I used to represent. Mm -hmm. and, were, and the people were treated impeccably there. And it was because they were going to be deported because they had no right to stay in the UK, but they were treated well, they were looked after, medical attention, dent dental attention. And she, in a big flurry of publicity, took a, an asylum seeker and said, I will look after them in my own home. 
uh, it wasn't until she realised that the asylum seeker wouldn't leave her own home that she suddenly became a bit disillusioned about the whole thing. <laughs> uh, so, you know, be careful, yes. be careful about uh, some of the commitments people make because it's a long term commitment you're making and I just hope the people that are offering their homes up understand that. Absolutely. But uh, from what I've seen of the Ukrainians, I'm very impressed with them and their fighting spirit and their character uh, facing such incredible opposition. Um, Tim, uh, as Christians, how should we be praying for the government in Ukraine and the Ukrainian people? And also now what is the biggest refugee crisis that we've seen in Europe since the, uh, end of, uh, since the Second World War over 80 years ago? Well, we've got to pray for peace, haven't we? I mean, that's got to be the first prayer. Let's pray for peace. Let's pray for this war to end. Um, as soon as possible, you know, and, and somehow to come to a peaceful end. And that's, that's, the, that's the top prayer. And then we've got to pray for our Christian brothers and sisters there who are you know, ministering to other people and, and serving them and praying for them and all of that kind of thing. And we're hearing some amazing stories of miracles and answers to prayer um, and bombs not exploding and all of that kind of thing. We just need to pray for protection uh, for people there and, and God to protect people and watch over them. And for this to end up causing a revival in, in Ukraine, that's what we really want to see, isn't it? You know, let's see a revival of Christianity um, in Ukraine and, and let's see it rise from the ashes into something more powerful and, and a real gospel centre. That, that's got to be the prayer that some good comes out of this in the end, surely. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, Mike, how important is it that uh, our, our viewers watching uh, are not succumb to kind of Russian propaganda? We've seen the influence of RT news uh, over at least a couple of decades on, on influencing people on the way that they perceive Putin and see this conflict and really saying that, uh, you know, what we're seeing in Ukraine is, 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 is make-believe, it's propaganda, which we know is lies. Well, I think uh, particularly people in public life who claim that uh, have to be publicly exposed. And there are university professors, I was reading the press today, who have been saying uh, some stuff about uh, fake news, i.e. that uh, the whole Ukraine thing is fake. And they're also retweeting messages. These people have to be called out. And in terms of their places, in uh, particularly in places of education, it has to be dealt with. But f the final thing for me is that we're very lucky. We've got a free press and we can get our news freely from a whole host of different stations. People should watch that, not Russia Today. Absolutely, including this programme. So uh, thank you, Michael and uh, Tim, for being my guests on Politics Today. And I want to thank, thank you for watching at home. I think it's imperative that we continue to pray and support the people of Ukraine. I mean, what we're seeing there is absolutely horrific, something we haven't seen on the continent of Europe for over 80 years. So we pray for peace and uh, we also pray for protection of Ukraine's president, Zelensky but it's important that we pray for Ukraine. So thank you for watching this week's edition of Politics Today. Thank you.